we continue with our study through the book of Acts. Um, we left off uh, chapter 23, we get into chapter, no, we get into chapter 23 today. We're nearing the end of this book. For those who are visiting us for the first time, you're most welcome. This is Calvary Chapel, and we, we love you and thank you for being here. Uh, for those who are here and your Chelsea and whatever the other team. Chelsea people, hi. Oh man, they have lost already. <laughs> no confidence. You know, our title for this morning is Be of Good Cheer. <laughs> Whether you are Chelsea or Arsenal, the Lord is still on the throne, amen? Let us pray together before we read God's word. We thank you, almighty God, for this opportunity you have granted to us to dive into your word. We pray that as we go through it, your Holy Spirit will be at work in us and through us to bring you glory, Lord. Help us to grasp the truth of your word and what you want us to receive for today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would drive it into our heart to receive it and to practice it in our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. This is a continuation of where we had left from, a dialogue, you remember, after Paul went to Jerusalem and it is trouble on either side. He gets into the trouble to, to uh, the temple and trouble follows him even right in the, in the temple. Say, this man is brought uh, the Gentiles into the temple. This is unlawful. He's doing things that are, uh, we, we don't approve He's telling people that they cannot be circumcised and all this trouble. And all Paul is doing is trying to share the gospel of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his commitment, you remember the, the, the last question we ask ourselves as we're studying this chapter is, what does commitment to Christ look like to you? Is this something that, you know, you commit yourself when conditions are favorable, but when things turn uh, to be a little bit harder or tough, you say, you know, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. Or we just uh, decide not to serve him anymore. We f if Paul finds himself in this situation, then throughout what we're going to study, today and the rest of the chapter, it is Paul being in prison. It is, he's on prison or house arrest. Prison, house arrest, until he dies. You know, that is what is marked out for him. Here in verses one says, then Paul, looking honestly, these are the people who brought him, uh, the, these Jewish people and the, the, the priest and the commander, He looked honestly at the council and said, men and brethren, I have lived in good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you too, <laughs> you whitewashed wall. For you seek to judge me according to the law, and, you do, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he cried out uh, in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, 
the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees says that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit of an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from amongst them and bring him into the barracks. Listen to verses 11. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Let's pause there for a minute. You see, in the introductory part, where we have the council, this council comprised of 70 men plus one. You remember back in Exodus, when uh, Moses would be running around trying to counsel people, dealing with people's problem, uh, and always back and forth in the mountain, talking to God and saying, oh, this is what they say, this is what they want. It was a lot for him to take, and he received counsel from his father-in-law, who said, hey, this thing is going to kill you. You're going to die, so please choose men from amongst you who will take care of this business. And if they're not able, they'll bring it to Moses and Moses will take it to God. So he chose 70 men plus Moses, 71. And this is the history of the Sanhedrin. This council was called the Sanhedrin. This is where uh, it trickled down to. And this group of men, the council of the 70 men, plus one, who is the high priest? They start to hear Paul. But Paul, you know, looked honestly at them, at this council, and say, men and brethren. This was not the usual address that you'd give this council. If you'd want to address properly, you'd say, rulers of the people or leaders of Israel, then they would know that you are recognizing their authority. But the fact that Paul said, brethren, meaning Paul equated himself with them. They were all equal. And this caused this man, Ananias, to be furious. <laughs> he got mad. He got fired. He said, Paul said, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. What does that mean? You, you think Paul, since he was born until now, his conscience has always been right? No, that is not what he meant. Until when he was going down the road to Damascus to persecute the church of Jesus Christ, the Lord appeared to him and the Lord struck him with blindness and he was taken to a place um, and the Lord spoke to him. He said, Lord, who are you? He said, I am Lord Jesus whom you persecute. And the Lord commanded uh, him 
of what was to become of him. And from that time, his conscience served him right as he served the Lord. The instruction that the Lord gave him was clear and Paul was abiding by that. And he said, until this day, my conscience is right before God. And this high priest got mad. You know, would you say today, this morning, that your conscience is serving you right? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Wicked man that I am, I got trouble. I got a lot of things going on in my mind. I, got, I have things I got to deal with every hour, every minute. Paul says, my conscience before God is good. In other words, the interpretation from the high priest would be, so you're saying we are doing the contrary. We have brought it to the council and you think our conscience is not serving us right? Is that what you think? And then the high priest commanded someone closer to him to do what? <laughs> Strike him on the mouth to shut up. Like you shut up. What do you know? Who are you? Do you know who I am? You know this council actually was illegal. They're just rushing to find reason to bring Paul down. This council was illegal and perhaps the high priest was not dressed accordingly because even Paul does not recognize him other scholars would say maybe because Paul has been beaten before and he's struggling with his eyesight. A lot of possibilities. But all we know is that Paul did not recognize him. Perhaps because he's not dealing with people with justice as the high priest should, he's not recognizing this man. Then Paul said to him, so he ordered people to strike Paul. Then Paul says this, God will strike you. <laughs> God will strike you. You know, tit for tat. Is it a fair game? <laughs> you know, there's somewhere in the Bible where Jesus says, hey, if someone slap you on this side, one side of your cheek, you do what? You willingly give the other side. At this very time and moment, I don't think, you know, it's like this scripture will, it evaporates out of your mind. <laughs> and all you want to do is to strike back. You hit me, I hit you. Same. We we'll levelize things. You've commanded a man to strike me, but you know what will happen to you? God himself will strike you. This is more dangerous. And history will take us down the line and we'll see that for sure, God will strike him. And he calls him, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> yeah, Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. Paul has another one, whitewashed walls. something that is not real. When they would speak of these terminologies, they would understand what it means, and technically this means that you are a hypocrite, that what we see of you is not the real thing. You've just painted these stones. They're not the real walls. You want us to have the image of what it is, but it ain't. You hypocrite. For you sit to judge according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? High priests do not do that. Probably that's why Paul did not recognize him. And those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know. <laughs> See, is Paul trying to pretend I don't think so. 
Because if you are a high priest, if you are a servant of God, there's a way you ought to behave yourself. Give proper judgment. The way you speak. Paul did not recognize that. Paul said, I do not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul is getting this reference from Exodus 22, verses 28. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of you. If that is the case, we see that Paul, the apostle, respects the office, but he does not have one respect for this man right here, a corrupt guy. You know, they say that he used to take tithes from the priests, <laughs> getting things illegally and lawful things was done, a lot of things with this man, no respect at all. So Paul called out the hypocrisy of the high priest while still honoring the office of the high priest. You know, the fact that many preachers have taken advantage of the flock of God, many people have taken advantage of God's people does not mean that that office is to be abused. The office remains to be true because God says that in the last days, I will give you shepherds who will take care of God's flock, his own flock. But we have shepherds who have taken advantage of God's people. And so what do people say? Oh, this is, it's all a hoax. All this church is all a hoax. It's not true. That is them. We know that that office remains to be true. It is God's. Paul reminds them of what is written about the high priest, though he didn't recognize this current one. So, brethren... We are to live by God's word, not emotions. Paul has left aside all the emotions and people are fired up and saying things. They say, uh-uh, I know what is written. You shall not revile. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. That is true. But the person who is right there is not doing what is right. And he's calling out the hypocrisy. So, friends, we got to live by God's word. Do you remember Jesus in the wilderness? He said to Satan, it is written. It is written. How do we overcome? When we use God's word. Say, it is written. It is written. But when Paul perceived, he discerned, because, well, Paul was here before. Paul was here before. He was in the council of the Sanhedrin. And do you know, at this point, Paul knows that they will never give righteous judgment. This same, same council, 25 years before this, they brought Jesus before them. And what did they do? These all these mosaics, they crucify him. He's breaking our law. He's doing this, he's doing this, and he's calling himself the king of the Jews. The same council. You think they're going to administer righteousness today? They ain't. And Paul discerned, and he knew that though they, they have ganged together against Paul, he knows how he's going to tear them apart. You know what he, he did? He, take, he took a grenade and threw it right in the middle, and there was a split. You know how the split came about? 
says this. Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, and he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. Boom. That is the bomb, right there. Why? Because now they have different views of this same matter of resurrection. <laughs> we have the Sadducees, and these are the liberals. <laughs> the liberals who are humanists, who don't, don't believe in spirituality, they don't believe in spirits, they don't believe in angels, that when you die, everything ceases. These are the Sadducees. And we have the Pharisees who are the conservatives who believe in the resurrection. So we got a problem right here <laughs> amongst themselves. So Paul is not going to be the main issue for a moment. <laughs> very clever, very wonderful. So instead of them coming straight to Paul, now they got to fight amongst themselves, <laughs> tearing themselves apart. Paul says, I am a what? A Pharisee. A son of a what? A Pharisee. So that means the Pharisees, they have come on his side. <laughs> and then he says, ah, concerning this issue, my hope and the issue of resurrection, I'm being judged. And these Pharisees and the scribes in there like, ah, no, 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 wait. We believe the same thing with this man. That was very quick. But you know what, friends? This group of people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they still exist in the church today. They don't just bear that name. But the way of life still remains. We have people who go to various churches, they proclaim to know Jesus, they proclaim to worship Jesus, but they only do a lip service, but their hearts are far away from Jesus Christ. Sadly enough, we have these people in our congregation who say, well, well I can do whatever I want with my body because when we die, we die. They don't want to be held accountable for the life that they live today. So, are you a liberal or a conservative? It is very sad, especially for the sad you see, they're very liberal. <laughs> they don't believe in the spirit. But they're among the what? The leaders of God's people. The Sanhedrin. Those who matter. <laughs> those who sit right in the high places. They don't believe it. They don't believe in Jesus. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the sad you see say that there is no resurrection, no angel, no spirit. But the Pharisees, but the fathers saw they believed in the resurrection, and so this was a split. Then there, so there, there arose an outcry from the scribes who were part of the Pharisees. And they protested saying, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. He just said what the other group does not believe in. If a spirit or an angel has spoken to this man, let's not fight against God. 
In other words, they're saying, hey, you and I, we ain't the same. <laughs> we don't believe the same. We got to put things straight. And this is very profound, church, that as, all, as, as we find opportunities to share the gospel, we got to draw lines. We got to draw lines. People are preaching something different. We got to draw lines. He said, oh, you call yourself a believer. What you say right now ain't it. That ain't what we see from the scripture. We ain't brothers. You're preaching another gospel. We ain't together. <laughs> you preach Jesus crucified, we're cool. We're good. You preach another gospel? No, no, no. And they continue with their fights. And this commander saw that this guy, they were gonna tear this man apart. Paul was gonna be torn apart. He sent his soldiers to go and bring him down to the barracks. But listen to what verses 11 say. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Paul, has, he always desired to go to Rome, to go and see Rome, to go and preach the gospel there, but you know what is happening? How he's gonna get there was not his original plan to get there. But at the end of the day, he's gonna get there. He didn't plan for it to go that way, but the Lord has his own plan. Friends, this is what the Lord requires of us to testify of him. And what becomes of that testimony that is up to the Lord? Because sometimes we preach to people, we speak to people, and when we see that their hearts are hardened, we get mad. Like the Lord, I've been preaching to people, I've been testifying, and none of them seems to yield to the gospel. He was uh, in the council, he was in the temple, Paul preaching the gospel, making a case for Christ, and none of them seems to yield to the gospel. But this, you know what? The Lord did not rebuke Paul when he came to him. He encouraged him. You know why he encouraged him? Because he was feeling discouraged. Anytime you hear these words when the Lord Jesus speaks, you know that the people he's speaking to or that person, they were utterly discouraged. Let's travel down and see a few instances where Jesus told people to be of good cheer. If we begin from this verse, uh, verses 11, he told Paul to be of good cheer. In John 16, verses 33, he said to the disciple, when they were wondering, when they, they were losing hope, he said, be of good cheer. The same word he says in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter eight, verses 48, he said to the woman with the issue of blood, daughter, be of good cheer. In Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 6, verses 50, Jesus assures the troubled disciple in the sea. They're right there. And they see, they thought he was a ghost. Jesus walking in the water, coming to them. Oh, they were fearful. He assured them that it is him. And he said, be of good cheer. And finally, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 2, he said to the paralytic, be of good cheer, son. And maybe, or perhaps today, he's saying to us, be of good cheer. 
that situation that you're in, he shows up and these are the words he says, because he knows that you're discouraged, because he knows that things are not working well for you, because he knows that you're about to lose hope. And he says, be of good cheer, son. Be of good cheer, daughter. That is all he's saying to us this morning. Be of good cheer. It is therefore important for God's people to realize that even in the moment where we feel alone, the Lord is watching and in due time, he shows up. Maybe Paul would have thought, you know, this is probably the end. I had desired to go to Rome. I ain't gonna go there. These guys are gonna tear me apart. I can't go there. I'm barely breathing well. There's no fresh air here. And then the Lord appears and says, hey, what you did in Jerusalem, you still gonna do it in Rome. This is an assurance that you still got life. (laughs) You still have breath. And he's saying, I still have more work for you to do. There's still jobs for you to do. When you're thinking about your past, you're thinking about the present, you don't know what is going to happen to you. This is what St. Augustine says. That trust the past to the mercy of God, the present to his love, and the future to his providence. That the mercy of God, the love of God, and the providence of God upon his people. You know, sometimes we, as this situation comes upon us, we try to find an easy way out. Never look for an easy way out. Look for a way that will please the Lord. Never look for an easy way out. Never look for shortcuts. Look for a way that will please the Lord. Sometimes you sit in your closet and you're thinking, man, feels like he's gone, he's far away. He's not here. Another friend of ours, E.W. Tozer, he reminds us That the nearness of God is our good. When you're speaking about the goodness of God, you are acknowledging his presence, that he's here with us. David said, hey, where can I go? Where can I hide myself? Even in hell, you're there. Where can I go? I cannot hide myself. You know it all. And also that the nearness of God is not a physical distance, but a spiritual reality. It is the awareness of God's presence in every aspect of our lives. Acknowledging God's presence in our lives. He's not gone. He's with us. When you think you've lost it all, he shows up and he say, move on. You think you're left alone like Elijah saying, huh? They've killed everybody. I alone am left. God says, no, no, no. I got 7,000. How do you feel about that? (laughs) Good news. Be of good cheer. As you have testified, for me in Jerusalem, you must. You know, when the Lord says you must, it is a task that has to be accomplished at whatever cost, whether by life or by death. And when it was day, some of the Jews 
banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had Paul killed. And this is one of those silly oaths that people would make. <laughs> that we, we're not going to eat, we're not going to drink until he's dead. You, you got to watch out the things you say. Because some of these things that will land you into trouble. You know, as we have said before, I've mentioned it many times. The preacher man, Solomon, says, do not be hasty when you go into the house of the Lord and making vows. For if you don't fulfill them, they become a trap and a snare to you. They'll bring you down. So don't be hasty saying words. You know, when you're speaking forcefully, the next thing you're going to act physically foolishly. You're going to do silly things. <laughs> don't be, don't join this bandits, this group of people. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you, talking to the high priest, therefore together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you are going to make further inquiries concerning him. This is a people plotting against Paul. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister's son heard of this, out of heart of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. And this is to tell you, you know, Paul never mentioned his family anywhere. And just, just here, his sister and his sister's son. And also this would tell you that as much as Paul is in trouble with all these people, the government and the religious leaders, it feels like his family still has a grip with these religious leaders. For how could his sister's son just go to the barracks where Paul is? This was a place that was guarded. Uh, no one just walks there. This is a man who is wanted. You don't just go there. H having access to the commander, how is that possible? That means they still had a grip with these people. So this, uh, his sister's son had this ambush. Then uh, Paul... He went and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurion to him and said, take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, to, uh, and said Paul the prisoner called to me and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them. For more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they, kill, they, till they have killed him. And now they are ready waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one, that you have revealed these things to me. And he called for two centurions saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to 
Caesarea at the third hour of the night. <laughs> this is it. This, it is amazing what God does. Uh, let's read on. And provide mounds to set Paul to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter in the following manner: Claudius uh, Lysias to the most excellent governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troop, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him, deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me, that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Like, bye-bye. I'm done with the letter. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him uh, by night to uh, Antipatris. The next day, they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. When they had come to um, Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor and also presented Paul to him, and when the governor had read it, he asked the province uh, he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accuser also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. This means he was in house arrest, waiting for his accusers to come. But you think about it, there are over 40 people who wants Paul dead? And then we have 470 protecting Paul, taking him to the governor. If, if these kind of things don't amaze you, I don't know what can amaze you in the Bible. <laughs> that what the enemy meant for evil, God is turning for good. He's driving as a king, <laughs> I was riding like this, security all over. They're taking him to see the governor. And he's not just, he, the house arrest, he's gonna be taken care of. <laughs> you know, this is what the enemy had planned. The enemy said, I'm not gonna eat, <laughs> no drink. I wonder what they're gonna do after they find out that this prisoner is not coming to them. This is the whole thing that God is doing in these last uh, verses. We see God's providential care upon his people. That no matter what happens, you know what Jesus said, you must bear witness to me at Rome. You must. So at whatever cost, he's going to get there. Whether in chains, free, he's going to get there. Friends, don't always think life is going to be a bed of roses. Everything is going to be easy. Everything is going to work out this way. Uh, sometimes you, you pray for easy. Easy doesn't come your way. The Lord has a way of taking you to that destination the very best way he knows. And this best way perhaps will purify you and make you a better man. Jesus did not come to Paul and say, you know, you, you're such a weak man. You're such a weakling. The message of Christ came to Paul as an encouragement 
to say, hey, though they did not receive this message, still go to Rome. And every place that Paul goes, you remember when he was told that you must suffer? He was told he was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the rulers. And God is fulfilling that through Paul. Later in one of his letters, he will say, hey, even the, the house of Caesar greet you. Perhaps, you know, they had the gospel and they believed. Though we are not told that many of these rulers got born again, but there's the effect of the gospel. When we do what we are supposed to do, we leave the rest to God. We leave the rest to God. He will convict people. He will draw men. All he says is that you, you lift me, I will draw men to myself. That is not our job. Our job is to preach the gospel and let God take care of the rest of the business. Amen? The worship team, you're welcome as we pray together. Um, maybe you, you, you find yourself in a situation where you, you do not know things. You do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. You can't even hold a finger on some things. You know what the Lord is saying? Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. He who overcame the world lives in you and he's here today. All he's calling for today is for you to say, hey Lord, here I am. Though I have not um, said it out loud, but I know I am in trouble. As we take a moment in prayer, I want you to stand up if you're able. You stand on your feet, every one of us. You know, this is, this is not those situations where we say, you know, this is just specific for the unbelievers. This is what we find ourselves in. As many of us are believers, we find ourselves in this situation. And maybe we, you just needed to hear these words and say, God, I am. I am the one you're speaking to today. Maybe you're the one who is in need of this encouragement. And maybe not just you. I need it this morning. I need to hear the, the voice of God saying, be of good cheer. If that is you and you want to join me raising your hand, you can raise it up. Say, God, I need you. We need encouragement. We need the Lord to whisper these words to us. Difficult situations, a lot of things happening in our lives. And the Lord is saying today, be of good cheer. Take heart, my child. Take heart, my son, my daughter. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all these hands raised towards you. Lord, you know their hearts. You know the condition of their hearts. You know what's happening with them. You know what is happening with me. And we all can attest that we are in need of you this morning. We needed to hear this today, but it is well with our souls. Some are discouraged. Some don't know where to go. Some don't know what to do.
But Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Speaking to us and saying, take courage, be strong. God, I pray that you come to our rescue, each one of us raising our hands. I know you're faithful and you're faithful to accomplish that which you start in us. You're faithful even to bring it to accomplishment. Though all we see are the mountains, though all we see are the obstacles, though all we see is darkened areas, Lord, I pray that our hearts will bear witness of your presence that is here with us, that it is well. Though the enemy has tried to bring us down, we know that he has no victory over us today. So we bless you and we thank you. Come to our rescue, all of us, all of us. In your name we pray. And Lord, as we give to you this morning what we had purposed in our hearts, I pray we'll give that with all reverence to you, knowing that it is you who provided ways and means for us to receive these gifts. So as we give to, to, to you, O oh God, we pray that you bless the works of our hands. In your name we pray.